Today we continue our exploration on the theme of karma and the afterlife. Today we go to section 5.3, which is subtitled Individuation, Becoming an Individual. Here we will explore the themes of meaning and purpose of life, which helps us to guide ourselves, to find directions, to become our true self, to discover our true self, if you like. When we talk about karma, the person that experiences the karma, we normally use the word the self, meaning the mind. It, karma, in other words, is created in the mind. And it is expressed, of course, to the mind also, to thought. It is also expressed to speech when, when our thoughts become verbalized, and become a kind of a sim, uh, symbolized by sound, designated by sound, and of course, physical action. Physical action in Buddhist psychology is called Kaya Vinyati, in other words, uh, bodily intimation. Kind of bodily action we do uh, has a kind of message, and this message, of course, is read variously in different cultures. And then there is a verbal intimation, in other words, uh, sounds we make, it's not just words, but also sounds also have uh, meanings to people. So, karma is created through body, speech, and mind, or through mind, speech, and body. Like the next thing we have to understand is. Um, karma is created through habits. Habits means something that we keep doing. In many ways, we do not have the free will to change this uh, rut that we are caught in until something big happens to us, like learning the Dharma or meeting a good teacher. So, um, it's something we have to struggle with. In other words, and of course, the best way to understand karma is to understand how the mind works. One of the most interesting things about the mind is the mind is always looking for meaning. The mind doesn't just look at something. The mind asks, in one way of one way of putting it, the mind asks, we ask, the self asks, what's the meaning of this? What do I make of this? This is a big issue in philosophy, meaning. For example, we can interpret, we can understand meaning as, as meaning value. So if we ask the question, what does it mean to you? In other words, uh, what value is it to you, for example? Or what use is it to you? So that's one meaning, not the only meaning. So, we can talk a lot about this idea of meaning. But sufficient for us as Buddhist practitioners to say, when we talk about meaning of life, we are talking about the first two of the Four Noble Truths. The first Noble Truth, of course, that suffering or unsatisfactoriness is universal, is everywhere. <clears throat> And there is this suffering, this unsatisfactoriness because of the universal nature of impermanence. Because everything is impermanent, they do not last forever, they're changing, you can never have uh, that thing that you like all the time, and therefore it is unsatisfactory. And true number two is uh, there is these conditions that bring about this kind of experience, this pain, this unsatisfactoriness. And that's craving. So it is a second aspect of the meaning of life. So this two truth, the first noble truth, second noble truth, suffering and the arising of suffering, also embodies the twelve links that depend on arising, how suffering arises. So this is how theoretically uh, the Buddha teaches us about the meaning of life, how to understand what's going on out there, inside us especially. Uh, of course, there are other meanings of life. For example, uh, for different people, 
depending on your job, you have different meanings of life. But the meaning has to be differentiated from purpose. Right here again, it's quite a tricky area because we're using language to explain language. It's like two mirrors look at each other and you get infinity. So, as I said, uh, when we talk about meaning, we can kind of roughly assume it to be value. And the purpose is, is the direction, the action that we're going to take. Having understood this meaning, and what, what are we going to do about it? That's purpose. Uh, but even that purpose is quite tricky because uh, it again depends what kind of person you are, what work you are doing. Uh, it's just like, you know, there are people who like to say, oh, everything happens, there must be a reason for everything that happens. Uh, it is not necessarily true here because the reason, the reason is not something that happens out there. The reasoning is a faculty, it is a, an action, if you like, of the mind. We project reason onto things. Right? So meaning and reason are very close. There's a lot of overlapping there. So the reason why this happened, different people will, will attribute different reasons for it. So in a sense, it's meaningless to say everything happens for a reason because we are the ones who attribute the reason to what happened. Someone else might attribute a different reason. So it really depends on the level of wisdom that we have. So the, the greater our wisdom, perhaps the, the, the better reason we, we give for a certain event. For example, we could explain why someone died, why there's a war, and so on. Right? So there are many ways of talking about it. So anyway, in connection, in connection with our reflection, our study today, we can say when it comes to the purpose of life, we should reflect on this third and fourth noble truths. The third noble truth here, of course, is the ending of suffering. And uh, here, of course, it refers to Nirvana. And the uh, fourth, of course, is the path leading to ending of suffering, the noble path. In the older texts, probably the original version of the Four Noble Truth, you, you have number three and four reversed. And it makes more sense that we actually, the Fourth Noble Truth comes third. In other words, the path, right? So we take the path and then we reach the Vana, which is Noble Truth number three actually. But in practice, Nirvana is last. It's the goal that we reach, where the path comes first and then the goal. So here is where you have two uh, kinds of, two arrangements of the Four Noble Truth. The one that we are familiar with is usually, is not, we call it the one, two, three, four arrangement. I call this the, the teaching model. In other words, when we, when a teacher teaches the Four Noble Truth, this is an easier way to teach. We explain, number one, what's so obvious, there is suffering, there is unsatisfactoriness. And number two, there is the arising of it, the conditions that bring it about. And then number three, we say, well, you can end this. And then the student says, wow, yeah, that's great. Then how do I do it? And then that's truth number four. This is how we do it, and the way for path. This, this is the teaching model. But when you actually experience it, when you actually practice it, right, you notice, okay, here's suffering, this is suffering, you reflect on it, this is the arising of suffering, this is the conditions that brought it about, and then after that uh, you say, okay, I'm going to end this, I'm going to practice, practice the path, sila, samadhi, panya, practice moral virtue, mental training, wisdom, and then you reach the goal. So when you actually practice the Four Noble Truth, are rearranged as one, two, four, three. Right? And this is this uh, sequence is found, for example, in the Maha Saratanika Sutta. Okay, so there we see kind of a very neat overview of the meaning and purpose of life. So, uh, of course, we can we need to look further to the deeper. How does this help us to understand nature of death, for example? Here we see our life progressing in phases uh, and in different stages. For example, 
you study English literature, I'm sure you're familiar with Shakespeare's As You Like It, where you have what I call the seven ages of man uh, in, in Jacques' monologue. It's a very sad man, Jacques was reflecting on uh, life in seven stages. This is found in As You Like It, Act 2, Scene 7. But in Buddhism, we, we do have a similar sequence of, of stages of life. In fact, in, in Buddhism, we have the ten stages of life. And this is uh, mentioned in the Buddha Gosha Sudhimanga. So this is where uh, life is reflected in terms of change by the decade. So this is uh, something interesting. So I just read it to you, the excerpt from Visuddhimagga. Chapter 20, Section 51, The Ten Stages of Life. Here in these decades, the first, the first ten years of a person's life, a person living a hundred years, are called the tender decade. So that's the first ten years, in other words. For he is a tender, unstable child then. The next ten years are called the sport decade, or playful decade, if you like. For he is very playful then, right? so that's between 10 and 20. The next 10 years are called the beauty decade. For his beauty full, fully blossoms then. Right? The word should be fully. Yeah? The next 10 years are called the strength decade. For his strength and power are fully mature then. The next 10 years are called the understanding decade, for his understanding is well established then. Even in one naturally weak in understanding, some understanding, it seems, arises then. The next 10 years is the decline decade. So this would be like, what, 10, 20, 30, 40, 16. 50, 60 years. The decline decade, for his fondness, for playfulness, beauty, strength, and understanding, decline then. And this is the age that I'm in right now. And then the 10 years are then the stooping decade. So there's been the 70s. No? For his person, his body stoops forward then. This would be true in, in the Sri Lanka or India perhaps, but if you keep healthy, of course, you, like the Buddha, he remains straight for until he's uh, quite long until the end, I think. The next 10 years are called the bent decade. For his person is bent like a plowshare then. The next ten years are called the dotage decade, for he dotes then and forgets uh, what he has done. Or this is called the senior moments. Eh? The next ten years are called the prone decade, for then the centenarian, the centenarian mostly lies prone, <laughs> lies in bed, in other words. So this is a kind of almost a humorous take on uh, kind of a hundred years, a century of life. Uh, okay, this is of course uh, something like uh, 500 years to a thousand years into the Buddha's time. But of course we need to revise a bit for our, our own time. But the general idea of decline is there. So this is the meaning of life, that is decline. Okay, so how, how do we prepare for this decline? What do we do? Do we wait until our minds are weak to study the Dharma, for example? So in a sense, the earlier we start, the better. The moment we are able to speak or to think, we should be studying Dharma. That helps a lot. It's just like doing meditation also. If you start young, then it's much easier. You get used to the idea of sitting still and peaceful. And if you have parents who meditate, family that meditate, it's really wonderful. And uh, I, I've seen some families who kind of regularly meditate and they have this wonderful feeling of, of peace. So, the, when you have this kind of uh, understanding, then you begin to have a clearer purpose in life also. In other words, you know better what to do, what not to do, and so on. Uh, basically here, one of the very important uh, understanding of a purpose in life also is what not to do. So this is where you have the precepts. We have the five precepts which tell us five things we should not do. 
So in a sense that is the we call apophatic action, and other words the action of non-action. These are five things which if you don't do, it's going to help you uh, kind of have a more purposeful and meaningful life. Not to kill, not to steal, not to commit sexual misconduct, not to speak falsehood, and not to get your mind drunk or drugged. And these are five basic rules of life, if you like. So this, the five precepts, in other words, straddle both the meaning and purpose of life. It prevents suffering and it helps you to think more clearly with the mental training and the horizon of wisdom. So when we look at the purpose of life, we have to again here we have to examine there are at least two levels. The first level is a very simple one. Let's say you have a, a group of people standing around a bus stop, let's say. And if you ask these people, if there are 10 people then you ask them, what's your purpose in standing here? And you find each of these 10 people will tell you, give you some, a different reason. So this is called instrumental purpose. For example, one might say, oh, I'm going home. And another one says, I'm going shopping. And another one says, I'm going to the hospital, and so on. So uh, each person has a purpose. Standing at a bus stop is, is going to do something. And, but those are worldly, kind of temporary kind of uh, purpose, if you like. So this is where we have a more important level of purpose, and this is called the intrinsic level of uh, purpose, the higher level, if you like. Uh, what is the purpose of life? What is happiness? Right? So, in, in other words, you have the worldly purpose and the ultimate purpose, so to speak. And this is what we deal with when we talk about Buddhism and we study Buddhism. So, when we ask this kind of basic and important questions, then we get the kind of answers that are found in the, the Buddha Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha. And once you keep on asking these kind of questions, you begin to see the meaning of life. Very simply here, we can say there is impermanence everywhere. And if you have to reject something as natural and universal as this, and of course you are going against nature, then you will not be happy. So going against nature means you are going the opposite direction and that kind of causes a lot of conflict and that's unhappiness. So it's natural that we should accept this impermanence. That's reality. And if we are able to accept this impermanence, then we are in the kind of in harmony with nature. Then we are happy. So, of course, one, one way of doing this is to reflect on impermanence, accept it. And uh, this is a very important theme in early Buddhism. Understanding impermanence, accepting impermanence. And if you do this you know, in a sustained way, whether through faith or through wisdom, you are at extreme willing in this life itself, if not definitely at the moment of passing away. So in a sense, that's the purpose of life. Our purpose of life right now as Buddhists, if we are not awakened yet, is to work towards attaining stream winning. Because if we don't, then the prospects are quite dark we would be reborn in one of the lower worlds, in the animal world, or asura world, or preta world, or the suffering states. So, now even if we are reborn in the heavens, say we do good meditation, but still we're not going to last very long there. Once the supporting karma is gone, then we'll fall from that state, like in snake and lettuce, you get eaten up by the snake and you go down straight to hell. So we need this awakening through stream winning that will strengthen our minds in such a way that we will never fall below the human state. In other words, we are always capable of spiritually growing even higher to non-return, to I mean to, to once return, non-return and arahat would to be like the Buddha himself, to be enlightened. So now once you attain the state of streaming, in other words, you accept impermanence and you are 
you flow with nature, you're happy, you begin to need less. You need the crowd less. You don't need to follow the crowd. The worldly people, the worldlings, naturally want to follow the crowd, need to follow the crowd. They're not sure what to do. It's just like the animals, they're always moving in crowds, partly for safety, partly they do not know what to do. And the leading animal will kind of do it for them, lead the way. But if you accept the nature of impermanence, you understand the nature of impermanence, then you're able to think for yourself, you're able to feel for yourself. You become your true self, and we call that for convenience an individual. So in that sense, the whole process is called individuation. In other words, becoming a true individual, i.e. becoming a non uh, stream winner, in other words, someone who's on the way to awakening to us, moving to us, Nirvana. So these are things we need to reflect on so that we find our life as a Buddhist is meaningful, we understand what the teaching is about, and it's purposeful, we know where we are going. And if we do that, then we truly will be happy as a true individual, even in this life itself. So this is the essence of this section here. Do read section 5.3 if you want further ideas and other readings, and you can look up in the footnotes. So we end here for today. One of the most important teachings in early Buddhism is to learn to spend quiet moments with ourselves. This is like opening a window, letting in some fresh air, and looking out into the beautiful, sunny garden outside. And we have this wonderful feeling of peace and spaciousness. It is in this kind of openness that we are able to understand ourselves better. We know where we should be going. So this is where we have peace as well as wisdom. And we feel happy because of this kind of situation. Reflecting in this way is a very joyful kind of experience of very good karma. But a part of such karma, may we be blessed with courage and strength to aspire to attain stream winning in this life itself. By the same token, by the power of tree jewels that are sent out of loving kindness to honor our love, grants our family, relatives, and friends, people who have been kind to us. May they be well, may they be happy. And also to those who are struggling with the truth, seeking happiness, may they find true happiness in this life itself. May all beings be well and happy. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.